Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks um, for waiting. I think we'll get started. There's still a lot of people coming in um, to the waiting room, but we'll get started and, um, and I'm really excited for today. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kirsten Slaughter, and I'm the chapter and education organizer for Wisconsin Farmers Union. And yes, that really is my last name. I did not just change it for this series. Um, thank you for joining the WFU Winter Meeting Series. As we look closely at the challenges around meat processing in Wisconsin and possible solutions. Today, we will be hearing from two Wisconsin farmers and a Wisconsin processor about what their experiences have been. We will have time for questions at the end. First, we'd like to cover a few housekeeping things. So please keep yourself muted. Any background noise can make it very difficult for others to hear the speakers. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. To open the chat, please click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And another Zoom reminder, you can change your view between speaker view to only see one person or gallery view to see everyone. And that button is most likely found in the upper right hand corner of your screen. This event is being recorded and we will share this on the WFU YouTube channel after so that it's easy for you to listen to again and share with others. Our goal today is to really understand the challenges and problems around meat processing in Wisconsin from the perspectives of farmers and processors. This will help us build the foundation for the rest of the series, looking at solutions, both brick and mortar solutions and policy solutions. Finally, to keep this at an hour today, we will be hearing from three knowledgeable people about their experiences. But we know that this is an issue affecting a lot of producers and processors in Wisconsin, and we want to hear your stories as well. We want to collect as many Snapchats as possible so that we can share the full impact. Please share um, these at the link in the chat now. Um, at this time, we would like to launch a poll. Um, and so we have a few questions for participants today. If you're a farmer, please um, take 30 seconds to answer the poll question that just launched. And if you're a consumer, please answer the following question in the chat. What barriers do you feel are limiting consumers from buying more locally? So again, there will be a poll for farmers that should hopefully launch soon. Um, and then if you're a consumer, you can answer the following question in the chat. What barriers do you feel are limiting consumers from buying more locally? Okay, we'll close the poll now um, and we'll, we can share kind of the results of that. All right, it looks like we have results in from the poll. Uh, hopefully everybody can see this on your screen. Um, the question was, if you're a farmer, are you currently experiencing longer wait time for processing dates or other impacts due to a shortage of meat processing capacity? And 56% of you said almost always or always. Uh, second highest response was 24% of folks said usually or most of the time. Thanks, Bobby. Um, and at this time, I would like to turn it over to our speakers. Each of them will have a chance to introduce themselves, talk about their operation, how they got into it, and some of the challenges. We will have all of them speak first, and then we'll follow it up with questions afterwards. Brandon, I think we'll turn it over to you um, briefly, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us about your operation. Hi, right, Kirsten. Uh, my name is Brandon Clare with J.M. Watkins in Plum City. Um, we're about 35 minutes southwest of Menominee. Um, I purchased this business. It had been around 
probably for about 50 years prior to me buying it. Um, it was had a very well perceived or, or actually a very good reputation in the in the community. Um, I graduated from Stout in 2000, moved down by Milwaukee for about 10 years. And after my wife and I had two boys, we decided to move back up here. Um, I kind of, I was working at a, at a job that wasn't real, wasn't a real good job because I was gone all the time. So I never was seeing my kids. So I decided that I was going to buy the meat locker in Plum City, which had been for sale for a few years. Um, not knowing anything about cutting meat other than I really don't like cutting deer up. Um, so it probably wasn't a very, wasn't one of the smarter decisions I've made in my life, I guess. Um, but it's turned out quite well. Uh, we bought the business in 2013. Um, sales at that first year were just over, just over 200,000. And this year we'll be knocking on the door of a million dollars. So it's, we've gone up quite a bit in, uh, in the seven years we've owned it. Um, our capacity is 16 to 17 beef a week and 10 to 15 pigs a week. Our, uh, our biggest problem with our capacity is just trying to get people to come in and get their meat back out of the building fast enough because our, our building is quite small. Um, other than that, we do, uh, we do venison, um, we trim only. So no cutting of deer, um, no boning, anything all like that. Uh, retail is a small portion of our, um, our business. Majority of our business is the slaughtering uh, for local farmers. Thanks, Brandon. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Ken. Hello, um, my name is Ken Schmidt. My wife, Laura, and I live in the town of Howard, Chippewa County. We have four kids, three girls, and the youngest, and then a boy. He's the youngest, poor kid. And I milk cows on my parents' farm in Nielsville for 20 some odd years. And I met Laurie in 2003. In 2004, we got married and I moved up there. She had a farm up there also. Um, and we started in with beef. And we calve 50 to 60 a year. And most of the calves go to the conventional market, uh, usually as feeders. Uh, probably going to sell next week and uh, we sell some meat um, not a lot I haven't really um, went there uh, and I also sell some animals wholesale to another guy who sells in the cities in Chicago Milwaukee and that's worked out pretty good um, I don't really prefer to do direct marketing so um, that's why we rent this route I also sell some shoots and livestock equipment. And um, the reason I bring that up is we'll probably, I'll probably tell a little anecdotal story later on connected with that so you understand the background on it. Um, I guess that's probably it in a nutshell, so. Thanks, Ken. Um, Ken, were you able to join on phone? Yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Um, okay, great. Thanks. So yeah, uh, rural internet's another issue we need to solve, right? Um, <laughs> so in a nutshell, our business, uh, my husband and I moved back uh, about 10 years ago, plus we transitioned over to all grass-fed and pasture-based. So um, we do 100% grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, and then pastured pork and poultry, turkeys at Thanksgiving, and broiler chickens during the summer, um, all on grass. Um, we do all direct marketing, actually, um, almost all direct marketing. We sell to customers in the upper Midwest. Um, we started um, really just with friends and family, selling sides and quarters of beef and, you know, half hogs, and then moved towards doing um, smaller bundles and then finally doing just custom um, orders. We have a really great web platform now in Grazecart. Um, anybody who wants to do direct marketing of meat, I highly recommend Grazecart. Um, so customers can just hop on our website and have a very um, 
familiar shopping experience and basically just put what they want into their carts. And then um, we had been doing what we called buyer's clubs, where we would drive to uh, primarily Madison and Milwaukee and the Chicago suburbs and stop um, three, four, five different locations. And people would come to us and pick up their meat. Um, or people um, have always and still do come to the farm some, but we're quite rural. So that doesn't work for a lot of folks. Um, so we were doing these buyers clubs and then COVID hit. Uh, we were also doing a farmer's market um, that was pretty successful for us. And then COVID hit and we kind of stopped doing um, the farmer's market and the buyers clubs and started shipping through FedEx one day ground. Um, and we had been planning on doing that, but just hadn't quite pulled the trigger yet. We actually had all the pieces in place. So we were super blessed that when um, COVID became an issue and people um, started hoarding meat, um, we were able to put them in boxes and ship them out. Um, so that has actually helped our business this year. Um, yeah, so that's our business in a nutshell. I guess we'll talk the processing piece a little bit later. Jen, um, Brendan, the, the first question for you, um, how have things like labor, equipment, infrastructure, and regulation and other legal issues kind of imp imp impacted your ability to operate? Um, of those, everything you've mentioned, Kirsten, the biggest problem we have is the labor side of things. Um, it's, it seems as though it's, this is pretty labor intensive work, obviously. Um, it's not easy. There's a lot of heavy lifting. So it's hard to find people that really want to do that sort of work. Um, so the labor I would say is, is by far the biggest thing. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that when my wife and I had two kids and we moved back, um, we had two boys. So that was my oldest son is 16 and he has become the probably the best person I have on the slaughter floor. I probably shouldn't say that because he's probably too young to be working out there, but he is he's by far the, the best employee I have out there. Um, so I'm hoping that he likes it enough where that'll help solve one of those problems. Um, the the uh, regulations isn't we're, we're a federally inspected plant, so we don't have we don't have a whole lot of trouble with that. Um, we get a lot of actually the federal side is is considerably easier than the state side. And they are, the federal government seems to be very um, prone to helping us um, if we have issues. They're general, we have a pretty good inspector. We're pretty lucky. And he is, he's always willing to help us out. And if, we, if there's an issue that comes up, um, he's right there with us trying to figure out what, uh, what would need to be done. Although I can't even think of an issue that we've had in the last, probably, we've been federal now for four years. Um, I'm trying to think of an issue we had that was that was unexpected, and I can't—I guess I can't even really think of anything like that. Um, equipment, equipment's always an issue because of just the sheer cost of everything. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy to buy a machine that costs uh, $120,000 that staples hamburger and makes ring bowling for you, and that's all it does. But it increases your production considerably, um, so that's that's the advantage of that because of the labor issue, you have to spend the money on the equipment so that um, when you can't find somebody to stuff burger out, at least you've got a machine, you've got it automated as much as we can do it in our current location. Um, and as far as infrastructure, we are, as I said earlier, we could do 15, 16 beef a week. Um, and that's, that's our biggest, next to labor, that's our biggest problem. We've decided that we probably are gonna build a new building in the spring. Um, and then, but however, my wife, Erin's like, well, that's a great idea to do that. You tell me how you're gonna staff it. So that's what we're looking at now to decide um, if, well, it'd be great if our kids want to do that, want to help us out, uh, but being 16, it's a little young. So that's our biggest issue I would say right now is just the, the labor and the, the building that we're in. And does that relate to the kind of lack of locker space that you had mentioned? Is that being a barrier to expansion? Uh, no, well, the, 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 our, our building, it, that wouldn't be a barrier to it. I would say that'd be, that'd be more of a, that's our biggest reason to move. It's just because of the sheer volume. Um, and our freezer space is so limited here. 
because we're actually in town. So it's not as most meat lockers in Wisconsin um, that have been around for 56 years, they're in small towns or in towns and it's a very limited space um, for our building. So that's, uh, that's the biggest reason we want to expand is because right now we're booking beef. We're booking 22 is 2022 is probably 85% filled up for us. So, and that's after we put our regular customers in that do, we got customers to bring in 10 beef a month or all the way down to the guy that brings in two beef every month or one beef every month. But we, we know they're gonna bring them in every year. So we've got them booked out. So our biggest, our biggest issue with that is just, we just, we can only do 15 or 16 beef here. And we could easily be doing 25 if we, if we had this room for it. Thanks. Ken, question for you. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you need to do to get um, processing dates and um, and how that impacts your business? Um, I've had it pretty good for the last number of years. Uh, about, oh, when I started getting tighter four or five years ago, well, one processing plant we lost up here in the Bloomer area. And I've had it good, but I've been booking them just after the first of the year. And I started hearing horror stories, like Brandon mentioned that down by Madison and also in his area that they're booking them out two years. So this year I did book a little earlier than January. I have, I've had them booked for a couple months ready for next year. And my processor, I always book plenty of dates. He doesn't care if I cancel, but he wants me to book them. So I'm not sitting here wanting a date. Um, I have in the past had time, trouble getting them in in the fall a number of years ago and I ended up going a quite a distance from home to get a couple butchered. Um, so we work, processor and I work well together, but he's overwhelmed basically. And he shares a kill flow with the other small processor in Bloomer. So, um, and they only have the inspector there one day a week, which it makes it crowded. And he's also tight on locker space and hanging space. So um i said something to him one day i says you wouldn't even mind another butcher plant in town would you he says no he says it'd be that'd be great <laughs> but his biggest problem just like brandon says is labor and the last few years he's had a lot of turnover and he's got a hard time keeping help and um that's what we're hearing all over pretty much i worked the uh, oshkosh show uh power and light show two years ago selling equipment and there's a couple came up and he was probably a little older than I, I'd say he's getting close to 60 and his wife and they're looking at some, some little bit of equipment for their plant. And they said the same thing. We would welcome, we're the only one in the County. We'd like another process or two because it's just too much for us. So that's the problem all over, I guess. Ken. Then can you talk a little bit about what kind of processing looks like for you and your family? Yeah, that was directed to me. Yes. Yes, sorry, it's a little hard to hear. Um, yeah, so having a good relationship with our processors has really been key. Um, we've gone a few different places in the past and really landed on Lena Made Meat. In Lena, Illinois, they're just, um, we're in South Central Wisconsin, so they're really only about 45 minutes from us, and they are USDA inspected. Um, and so when dates start getting really filled up, they will actually call us and say, hey, you're, you know, only booked six months out, you need to book for the next year and a half. <laughs> so, I mean, we are booked into 2022. Um, and actually just today had the issue that we had lamb dates and I had two lambs that I would have liked to have let grow for a while longer, but I don't have the dates in a couple of months. So we had to take them small. So that's, um, you know, it's not the end of the world, but that's a little bit of a loss. You never want to take an animal that's not really ready. Um, but then on the other hand too, we we were generous with making a lot of dates. And so we've got dates on the books and now I can be really popular and say to folks, hey, I've got you know five extra lamb dates, who wants them? Um, because I know nobody else can get dates either. Um, so it's a trick. Uh, what we have done is really in some ways 
uh, de-seasonalize our beef production, and we just take beef every three weeks. So we have all those dates on the calendar for five to six beef every three weeks. And if we end up running into not needing them, we can project that a couple months in advance and let our processor know, or we can find friends who surely have, you know, an animal here or there that they would like to take in. Um, but doing the retail sales, the relationship with our processors has been super critical um, so that we actually get back meat that looks nice and is well labeled and properly labeled and um, that vacuum seals hold and all of that stuff is, is the trick because the customer expects it to look a certain way and uh, it's taken some kind of training of our processors on what we need things to look like and what portion sizes and such. Jen. Yeah. And then another question for you. Um, so, you know, as we're trying to gather farmers and processors together, how can farmers support expansion of current facilities or the creation of new small to mid scale operations? Yeah, um, great question. I um, sat in on a call about a month ago, and I would actually encourage the folks on this call to look it up. Um, it was through the Grass-Fed Exchange, which many will be familiar with. Um, on November 9th, they did, uh, they call it a hallway conversation or something, um, just a conversation that's on their Facebook page now with Rebecca Thistlewaite and Mike Lorenz of Lorenz Meat in Cannon Falls um, and Todd Churchill. And they were just discussing processing. Um, and the thing that stood out to me the most from that conversation was um, Rebecca Thistlewaite, um, who's a gal out east, I want to say Oregon or Washington, um, was talking about how she really likes to work with farmers who are entrepreneurs and who really have a business mindset and are going to stick around for a while and really be consistent for the processors. Because from the processor's side, they don't really want these farmers that are going to, you know, come there with two beef and then never, ever show up again. They want to know if I'm going to expand and buy all this really expensive equipment that Brandon was talking about, that, you know, these farmers are really <clears throat> part of this business and really, <clears throat> excuse me, really um, committed to actually bringing in the volume that that processor needs to make it worth expanding or building a new facility or whatever. So I think there needs to be a strong understanding for us as farmers that if we want better processing, we need to um, maybe financially or at least, you know, maybe do some prepayment or some things that really help those processors know that we're going to be there for them if they put in the financial investment into their facilities. And, and Brandon, I'll ask you the same question. Um, from your point of view, um, how can farmers support kind of expansion or um, processors? Uh, right now, the biggest support we need is their patience. Unfortunately, that's not, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to market beef, that's not always a something you're looking for. You obviously want dates. Um, what Jen said is a very good point though. It, it's, you'd obviously would like to have farmers that are gonna bring in like one of her, her customers, five or six, or she has the need for five or six beef every three weeks. That's awesome. Um, and that, that'd be great if we could say, like I said, though, in, in 22, we're booked out so far because we put our regular customers in. Um, for us, the the consistent work is by far, you know, I mean, it's, it's by far the best scenario for us because we know what we're going to be doing. Um, the farmer that brings 10 beef in a month, uh, if he if he all of a sudden up and quits, well, then we have an issue. So, you know, diversifying our own businesses um, through more retail wholesale, um, venison processing, um, and then with the slaughter is, is the best case scenario for us. What farmers can do um, is just, like I say, be patient. Um, but then for them to do more direct marketing, um, as I know Jen likes to do that, Ken's not real keen on that, which I can understand. I can certainly see both sides of that because we got farmers that the, the one that brings 10 beef in a month, he's got spreadsheets he's bringing down. It's probably, a, a, I would say a full-time job for him 
but it's probably 10 or 15 hours every couple of weeks, every two weeks or five hours a week that he has to spend with that. So it's for the, for the farmers, it's a, it's a, it's a real commitment for them to do their direct marketing. Um, the cost benefits are by far better um, for them to do that, especially we're about 45 minutes from St. Paul. Um, so for us, it's it's easy for them, for, not for them, but for people from the cities, um, Hudson, Rochester area to come here. Um, so the farmers are able to direct market those people and they're not afraid to drive that 45 minutes down through beautiful Western Wisconsin. So I'd say that's a, the, the patience and the the desire for them to bring in steady work is, is the best case scenario for us. Um, on the other hand, our business is built with the people, the farmer that brings in two beef every year. And uh, uh, if I could share a story, one of the other local supplier or processors um, had, had done someone's beef for 30 years. He, he called me up, he's like, I've been taking my beef to this other place for 30 years and I take one beef in every year. And he didn't even save a spot for me. He's too busy to do my meat. So I'm going to start bringing it to your place. And I, I kind of, luckily I was on the phone because I rolled my eyes. And I thought, well, I'm really glad you're coming down, but it's it's really hard for us to plan for you to bring your one beef in every year. So I can see both sides of the, of the coin here where it's two beef every year. It's a beef every year. But obviously for us, the best case scenario is to, have consistent every month or every two months. Thanks. And Ken, a question for you. How has consolidation in the livestock industry impacted your business and marketing decisions? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I guess, well, my inputs have went up, I'm sure of that. I, I mean, from, I spend more in vaccines now for my beef herd than I spent in the whole year on vet costs on my dairy herd, you know, 18 to 20 years ago. And of course we have a few more animals, but still vaccines shouldn't cost that much in comparison to having a vet out. Um, and the consolidation on the selling end is probably the biggest problem. We have a lack of markets. Um, it's, it's a little better than it was for a while. When I was still milking cows yet, one co-op, and I'll try to take the high ground here, not mention any names, but one co-op bought out the other small co-op and pretty soon don't, we had two sale barns from the same co-op 40 miles away and 60 miles in the other direction and nothing else to sell to. So what that tends to do is it congregates your buyers in one sale barn and they no longer have to worry about, they can kind of wink at each other and bid they don't have to worry about that farmer going somewhere else to a different sale barn if he doesn't get a good price because you know they know there's no other place to sell and it's kind of the business model of some businesses to buy out the competition rather than do a good job to build your business you just buy out the competition so there is none and i think we're seeing that all over in agriculture to a degree thank you and um jen Another question for you. Um, how has the prohibition on selling meat from state inspected plants across state lines affected your processing decisions? You mentioned going to Illinois. So um, how have you been able to navigate that? <laughs> yeah, um, early on we were um, going to a state inspected plant that we were happy with, Hosley Meats and New Glarus. Um, and we initially were selling sides and quarters pretty much. Um, and a lot of those were going to Illinois. And I think we didn't know what we didn't know. And we might not have been completely legal that whole time. Um, but we were told, oh, no, you can take, you know, sides and quarters. That's okay because they're pre-sold. Um, so I think we were in a pretty gray area with that. But then when we started to do more custom bundles and custom orders, uh, really felt like, okay, we need to be federally inspected. And so talk to them about taking advantage of this um, 
so others on this call know more about this than I do, but the, the, the you know, two state ex exemption or whatever, where um, supposedly it's kind of an easy process where a state inspected plant can get their federal um, added on to that. But from Hosley's perspective, that was not a simple process and it would be costly and it wasn't worth it for them because you know, they're booked out so far. And so while we had a good relationship, they didn't really need our business to stay in business. Um, so we ended up switching then to Lena Made Me, um, whom we're also very happy with. Um, but that, you know, took time to build that relationship to be what we both needed um, the processing to look like and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's tricky. We definitely need um, consistency, you know, because if we were to need to jump around, um, which we have had to go a couple different places just to get some slots, you know, every spot doesn't have our labels and every spot has different recipes for, you know, sausages or beef sticks or whatever. So um, the consistency for us has, has been a key, which is why we really are trying to stay on top of making sure that we have even more butcher dates than we need. Um, so yeah, it, it would be really nice if it was easier for these state plants to have that federal inspected label um, for everybody to sell. Thanks. There's a lot of questions already in the chat and we're gonna get to those in a moment, but first we have one more short poll and I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby to launch that poll. All right, everyone should see this poll in front of you. So this question is a simple one. Have you seen processing facilities close in your area? And we'll give folks just a minute or two to answer this question. And it looks like there's a question here over how many years? Um, that is a good question. Maybe let's say within the last, uh, uh, what's a good time slot? Maybe within the last five years or so, have you seen processing facilities close in your area? And if you've already answered and it's been longer than that, uh, that's okay. We didn't specify before. All right, just a couple more seconds. And we will go ahead and close this poll. And you should be able to see the results of the poll on your screen. It looks like 61% of the folks on this call have seen processing facilities close in their area. So good majority of people. So um, there's already a number of questions in the chat. If folks have others, you can put those in the chat as well. And if you're on the phone and would like to ask a question, you can press star nine and it will alert us and then we can call on you based on the last four digits of your um, phone number. So again, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine to let us know that you'd like to speak. Um, so uh, one question, um, maybe for Brandon, but um, I know Jen was just talking about this as well. What are the cost differences between being state inspected and USDA inspected for meat processors? And why aren't there more USDA inspected processors in Wisconsin? Uh, the cost difference is really, it's negligible. I mean, there's really, there's no difference in pricing as far as um, licensing is concerned. Um, Jen had mentioned a program between the state of Wisconsin or with, with, with the state of Wisconsin and the federal government, which is a co-op interstate shipment program. Um, from what I, we were, we went right from a state plant to a federal plant. People that I know have tried to use the CIS program. Uh, they found it very cumbersome. And I, I pulled up a, a place up in uh, Weyerhaeuser that did it. It took them approximately nine months to get it taken care of. Where our, from the time we started our, from our state, licensing to our federal licensing, I believe we had our grant in three months. Um, so it's, unfortunately, it's a, it's a great idea. Unfortunately, it seems like the state of Wisconsin makes it very cumbersome for uh, people to actually achieve that. It's, it's, it's very time consuming. As far as why are, as far as why are there not more federal license plans? I think it's just a matter of people don't realize um, how easy it actually, I shouldn't say easy, how much easier it is to be a federal plant than it is a state plant. 
Um, one example is like a retail exempt. We can sell retail product out of our store that that doesn't have to have a stamp on it, any uh, our federal stamp on it. Um, it sounded like a great advantage at first. After we did it a while, we're like, I think it's because because of the record keeping and trying to keep two separate. Okay, we cooked this product and that's strictly for retail versus we cook this product and that is wholesale or goes back with someone's custom slaughter. Uh, we decided it wasn't worth it. So if we had more of a retail presence, I suspect that would it would probably be more of an advantage. But the just the just the reason for not going federal, um, it's it's kind of intimidating. Um, you're comfortable with your state inspector. You know what to expect from them. Um, when we switched to federal, it was it was harder, just because we didn't know what they really want, what they were looking for. But if I if there's other processes on here. It's no different than when you get a different state inspector from the one you had. Um, so it's just it's kind of what each individual inspector is looking for. The rules are pretty much the same for both of them. Thanks. Um, Jen, a question for you. Um, how many times per month are you bringing in animals and are those dates already set for 2021 and 2022? Yeah, great question. Um, multiple times a month, we're taking animals in. We actually just finished our marathon season of taking animals in because we do do turkeys. So we took four batches of turkeys um, to Twin City Pack over um, near Beloit. Um, so, you know, during the months of October, November, December, it's once a week, um, sometimes twice a day, depending on <laughs> the day. Um, but, you know, like I said, with our beef, we've kind of spread throughout the year. Lambs have remained pretty seasonal. We butcher them in the late fall, early winter. Um, and then pigs, we have with our um, marketing the customer cycle and what we've found to be the best production on our farm. We basically raise three batches of pigs a year um, and they do overlap each other. But um, with the systems we run, we basically will butcher um, you know, 12 to 15 at a time, um, over about a three week period, three times a year. Um, and then we just do our broiler chickens in the summer. So the summers get pretty busy to run in chickens, um, back and forth. Um, but we're pretty much hauling creatures, um, every month of the year. Although we've kind of, we're going to take about four weeks off here for the holidays. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, another question. Um, Brandon, do you have two inspectors on the kill floor then? Um, and do you need inspectors present when you're cutting up the animals? Uh, the way it works for us is we're small enough uh, where we only have one inspector. Um, he comes, we slaughter on Tuesdays. We cannot start till he gets here. Um, and he does not leave until we're done. And then, so that's Tuesdays are a big day for him. Um, he also inspects uh, UW River Falls and another plant in Hudson, uh, which is all retail and wholesale. They don't slaughter. Um, during the week, Monday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he stops by. He might be here for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, um, comes in, checks paperwork. Uh, he spends a lot of time watching us trim meat. So I, I it's probably not the most, I, I asked him if that's the, if that's really what he wanted to do when he took this job and, but it's one of the, one of the things he gets to do. So we only have one inspector, even the plants around here that do more than us. Uh, it's pretty rare that you would have two inspectors on a, on a kill, kill facility like ours uh, in this area, but he comes every day. Thanks. Another question for you, actually. Um, so a question, Someone is saying that there is a newer processor that opened near them that's only custom, and a few farmers have been trying to convince them to become state inspected. Do you have any incentives or ideas to help um, convince this processor? Um, well, if they're, it's hard to convince anybody to do anything now because everyone's so busy. So if they're comfortable and they got enough work doing 
just custom exempt, um, it's going to be tough for them to say, hey, state of Wisconsin, why don't you come in and start looking at our records and and uh, watch us slaughter and, and do all that stuff. So as far as I understand the question, as far as the, the producer's side, um, it's certainly I, I think, unfortunately, the only hope you probably have is that if things slow down enough where they maybe want to start doing some uh, retail or they want to do some uh, wholesale accounts. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have any good answers for you because of just because of the lack of of options that you have. They're so busy. The processor doesn't really need to do anything more than what they're doing now, unfortunately. We've had a little bit of a discussion in the chat about um, locker space being a kind of a bottleneck for farmers. Um, does anybody want to talk about um, maybe ways that we could address that or kind of their um, experience with um, locker space? Uh, Kristen? Yeah. Just again, uh, the guy I sell to was having problems with freezer space also. And there's a cold storage up in Eau Claire and he's been, um, you can, he has to take a pallet at a time, either in or out, and he can store it there. It's, it's reasonably cheap, but the hang up is he has to take that pallet back. So he has to have what he thinks he's gonna sell kind on each pallet. He can't make one pallet all hamburger and one all roast. He has to have it mixed. And, but it's, it's economical, but then it's, you gotta go get it and you gotta, pick it up and keep it cold and all that, but it is another option for somebody who wants to direct market and butcher or say grass fed and you want to do it in the summer, that's an option. So you got meat for sales all winter long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same for us. This is Jen. Um, we have to pick up our meat as soon as it's cut and frozen. Um, they need to get it out of there because they don't have space to store um, at any of our places. So we do take um, pallets. Uh, we've got big plastic like bin pallets that we actually put our meat in and take them straight to a cold storage unit that's only like 12 miles from us. So we're really lucky to have that. I know that not everywhere has that um, frozen storage warehousing. And people can keep putting those questions in the chat. Um, there was one question earlier about um, a hog CAFO coming into the area. How does that affect kind of local farmers and processors in the area when um, there's a, an increase in the number of animals in an area? I'm sorry, Kirsten, what was the first part of your question? Yeah, um, there was a question about a hog CAFO coming into an area and kind of wondering how does that impact kind of um, lo local processors and farmers when there's a large kind of influx in the number of animals. Uh, for once, it would certainly be, I mean, if, and if it would, in your area, I mean, if you've got people that can handle that, um, if it will drive, I mean, if, if it'll drive out the smaller producer and and they don't have their spots filled up, it's going to be, it'd be almost impossible uh, for them to get their spots and their animals slotted. So this is Jen again. Um, we dealt with the CAFO issue down here in Greene County. Um, a big 6,000 cow dairy came in, which is a different thing than what this question is referring to. But what we kind of learned in that process at least usually these giant operations, hog operations and such will be vertically integrated and will already have, you know, they'll be um, contracted to take their hogs to, you know, the huge processing plants in Iowa or wherever um, that are kind of behind putting in the CAFO to begin with. So it's not as much of an effect on the butcher slot for the small local producer who's direct marketing as one might think. Um, and it's also not the same end customer. So these are the kind of places that sell, you know, Walmart meats, um, whereas the direct market seller is typically selling into higher end markets. Um, those are generalizations. I know that's not always the case, but generally speaking, you know, it's terrible to have a CAFO next door, but they're not 
really in the same marketplace. Thanks. Um, here is a question that maybe we should have clarified at the beginning. Um, would one of the three of you take a moment to explain the differences between custom, state, and USDA processors? Um, USDA is uh, gives me the ability I can sell anywhere in the continental United States. I can sell anywhere in the world, actually, if I want to, because of my, my stamp. Um, state is I cannot take anything to we're close to Minnesota, so I couldn't sell my product to a grocery store in Wabasha, Minnesota for them to resale. Um, and then exempt is there's no inspection. Um, you take a lot of times it's done on farm. Somebody will come out and slaughter your animal on farm and take it in. And then you technically that can't be sold. So unless it was sold prior to the animal actually getting butchered. Um, so if you have a, a lot of times what happens is you have a, a dairy cow or something that um, that they're going to the farmer's going to take in and grind up for hamburger um, that comes right back to that farmer they don't resell it um, but that's that's the main difference. Thank you. Um, Jen, a question for you about graze cart. Is that for only USDA inspected meat or is state in inspected permitted? Oh, I, state inspected would be permitted, um, but then you would just need to be careful to only sell within your state. Um, it's just a platform. It's just a technology um, that has been developed by kind of the uh, folks that we kind of see as our mentor farm, um, Seven Sons out of Indiana. Um, they realized that there's not a real good online shopping um, platform for selling meats for a number of different reasons. And so they developed their own and have now streamlined it and actually just came out with a new version that's really cool. Um, so I have not seen anything that holds the light to Graze Cart um, as far as being able to sell meat direct to customers. Thanks. We have a question from somebody on the phone. Um, last four digits, one, three, two, three. You can um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, this is Hallie and Nielsa. How are you guys? Hi. Hi. So my quick question is that uh, we're not too far from Brandon. We're over in the Nielsville area, Ken's old stomping grounds. But um, most of our processors that are within like 45 minutes to an hour, which thank goodness that's all we're traveling right now, um, they are all also selling a lot of retail. So for us as farmers, when we get our um, animals in, uh, we are competing with them. Um, for, you know, butcher spots and times and, and hanging times. And I really haven't found um, too many processors in our areas that's doing mostly custom. So that's been a real challenge for us, especially when COVID hit. You know, they have a lot of customers coming to them saying, hey, I want a quarter. Hey, I want a half. You know, they're not necessarily always going to the farmer and looking for quarters and halves and cuts. And so we actually got, we didn't luckily get our butcher dates bumped, but we actually had times where, you know, animals got hung longer than we wanted them to and different things like that because they were trying to fill orders on their end. Um, and that was a little bit crazy. So I'm sure other people have dealt with that. I just wanted to put that out there as to, um, you know, we're really lacking some of those processors that are just doing um, custom or that their majority is custom because we do run into competing, you know, with our butcher, um, you know, for, for that instance. And then I can just take any other comments. That'd be great if anybody has any suggestions there. Thank you. Yeah, I sympathize with you. That's one thing I noticed when I moved from, Neil, this is Ken, from Nielsville to Bloomer was there was a lot of small processors and meat plants up there very close, whereas, like you say here, it's Alma Center or over to Hewitt, basically. I guess now there's a couple of Mennonites started up on 29, but you got a drive a ways from Nielsville, and they got the same problem in the northern part of the state. I know a couple guys up there, and they're driving an hour, hour and a half to get to a, their processor. I was just going to comment uh, about that. We also, I mean, we sell a lot of quarters and halves, but we buy them from, I mean, if I got my farmer that's bringing eight, 10 beef in a month, I know what his beef look like. 
So I'm pretty comfortable selling. I'll, I'll buy my beef from that individual or if they want a Jersey, I'll buy that from the, uh, the guy that I bring the Jersey beef in. So we're, and I don't, maybe I misunderstood, but a lot of times if we're selling quarters, we're buying those from the individual farmers that uh, bring their animals to us all the time anyway. So I feel like a couple of our, a couple of our farmers are coming. I'm probably their biggest purchaser of it, of their own animals. So hopefully there'd be some benefit to getting to know your processor uh, a little better and, and, and maybe just coming out and saying, Hey, if you ever need beef, this is what we got. And if, and if the, the quality is there that he's looking for i would certainly think he'd be interested in in purchasing some beef from you thank you all um as we close out today i just want to um let people know that this is a whole series well the rest of um kind of through april we'll be talking about solutions and continuing these conversations um kind of looking at what other people have done, um, what are policy solutions, what are things that we can continue to advocate for. And you can register for the rest of those um, events on our website, along with a lot of other exciting events that we're putting on. Um, if you liked what you heard today and are not already a member, we hope that you will join Wisconsin Farmers Union. We are approaching this from all angles of our WFU triangle through education, cooperation, and legislation. And we know that we can make a greater change when more people come together. So please join today. Um, also, we would like to remind you to share your short snapshot story of processing. That link will also be in the chat again. Um, and finally, thank you so much to our panelists today. Um, we really appreciated you talking with us and sharing your story. Um, and we look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. So thank you for joining us today and see you next time.